Um, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to our brown bag program. Um, today, Candace has uh, agreed to do a program on tales from the Schweinfelder genealogical record. So we're very um, grateful that Candace can step in for Bob Wood, who was unable to be here today. And we hope to have Bob speaking on his topic um, in 2024. Um, the brown bag program for October. Oh, should I speak up? Yeah. <laughs> How's that, Jim? Is that better? Okay. And and plus, Candace projects really well. So. <laughs> But um, I just want to announce our topic for October's brown bag. It's October 11th, and it's going to be Life in Wolf Wolfenbüttel from 1904 to 1919. Elmer, Agnes, Roland, and Selena, and Dr. V. Meyer is going to give that program. He's been working on transcribing some of the um, diaries from Elmer Johnson and has a lot of information uh, from those years when they were working to assemble all the Schweinfelder um, books and records and artifacts and bring them back to Pennsylvania. So um, this presentation is going to give impressions of people, places, work, travel, shopping, recreation, and other activities of the Johnsons and Selena um, while they were in Germany. So please be sure to attend that. And now I'll turn the program over to Candace. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming out and seeing me yet again. And I apologize for being the constant speaker here. But, <laughs> but uh, today I'm gonna be talking about, let me get myself organized here. Um, a topic that I've actually done before, which is um, the tales from the Schwenkfelder genealogical record. Now I've added some new things in. I can't do these programs without doing more research. So I, I've added things in from previous a previous program and hopefully none of you remember the previous program. <laughs> I, you probably won't because I did these several years ago. And um, so it's probably going to be new information for most of you. Come on, mister. Yeah. I don't want to touch anything else because I don't want to mess up. Just one minute technical difficulty. In terms of it, sort of, it's okay. Can we go back? Highly technical move there. <laughs> so that's, I think it was. Okay. Okay. Here we go. So this year is the 100th birthday of this marvelous book, which some uh, pretty professional, well-known genealogist once said to me, is one of the best anecdotal genealogies in ever written in and published in the United States. So this is really an exceptional book. If um, you're not familiar with it, and some of you I know do not have Schweinfelder heritage, so I know you wouldn't necessarily be familiar with it. It's it's really fun just to page through and, and learn about these people. It's it's extraordinary the amount of material that was collected in 1923 um, before any kind of modern technical assistance was out there. It was just through letters and type the typewriter and really amazing what um, Samuel Brecht and his team who put the genealogical record together, how they did this. I, I, I It's still a feat of great wonder to me. And I understand that Jerry Hebner, one of our board members, is going to be talking about the genealogical record and how it came to be. So I don't want to go and steal his thunder too much. Um, 
Today, I'm going to be talking about, unfortunately, mostly men, because it was 1923, and those are the stories that really got recorded in the genealogical record and the individuals that are easiest to research. They're also individuals mostly from the 19th and 20th centuries, not from the earlier period, because it was in the 19th and 20th centuries that the, the lives of many of these individuals changed from being farmers or craftspeople living locally, but expanding their reach out into the world and doing other things and marrying different people. And so their lives just taking completely different um, directions than they ever did before from the time of immigration. So first, let us talk about a brilliant young aviator and it was this young man, Cecil M. Paoli, who was the son of Fanny Smith Paoli, who was the descendant the, in the genealogical record. She was the Schwenkfelder descendant. For those of you who don't know, those GR numbers mean genealogical record and then the number, the, her family number and, um, and her individual number, which would be that 192-286. So that is where you find um, Fanny Smith Paoli in the genealogical record. Um, among other things, this very young man who earned his pilot's license, I believe at the age of 17, quite extraordinary. And at the time was the youngest individual holding a pilot's license in the United States um, during the 19 teens. Um, he was the first aviator to cross the Andes with a uh, mail. He did a mail delivery to cross the Andes, which is, the, maybe some of you have actually visited the Andes, a quite astounding feat in and of itself. Um, he also, before he became um, an aviator, a real aviator, he was building model airplanes, and that's really how he got his footing as an aviator, he started building these model airplanes. And here are a couple of examples, one in a model airplane advertisement um, from the early 19 teens, and then an actual plane that, that Cecil designed himself. And here is Fanny sitting with Cecil in, in um, a biplane. And you can see, can you see her there on the, um, with, she's, her, she has the white blouse on, I guess you can kind of see her, but she was uh, supposedly the first mother to ever fly in an airplane, <laughs> which is amazing, isn't it? I just, I just am really astounded by, by Cecil and his brilliance and her, her, his mother's bravery. Can you imagine the courage it took to go up with this very young man, very, very young man in his plane and trust him? It's really quite wonderful. But trage tragedy struck and not that long after the first ride by Fanny in the airplane um, where um, his biplane collapsed. It was a plane of his own design um, in 1915. He was just 22 years old. Um, and the plane collapsed in College Park, Maryland. So sadly, uh, did not have a good ending, but I, I truly do wonder what would have happened with Cecil and what he would have become, especially with the wars on the horizon, um, how, how he could have contributed to aviation history. He, he did already. He, he was a, he's an important individual in aviation history, but what he would have contributed had he lived. Oh, and just as a side note, I'm also very interested in in the um, the side ancestry of uh, the non Schwenkfelder ancestry of some of these individuals. And um, Cecil's grandfather was actually a very well known Cuban American painter named Juan Jorge Paoli, and um, he also this Paoli was also a well known art collector who's collection was sold after his death and much of it is um in our biggest museums in the country um uh he had caravaggios and rembrandts and all kinds of extraordinary things that um 
were of great are of great value today and even of great value in the past. Okay, now this story is one that maybe some of you heard um, our Alan V. Meyer tell. I know he covered this in a uh, past brown bag lecture, but I decided to do it again and go a little bit more in depth because it's been several years since Alan actually discussed this. So Horace Krauss, um, or Harry Bechtel, as he became known, um, was the grandson of Andrew Krauss, the organ builder, which to those of us who are involved with the Schwenkfelder group uh, know him quite well. Uh, we have an example of one of the organs in the Rural Entrepreneurship Gallery. He was um, a very significant individual, certainly up here in the Upper Hanover, Lower Milford vicinity where the Krauses lived. And um, uh, very, very significant Schwenkfelder, let's put it that way. But Harry himself was a music teacher. He taught in Lansdale and here in the upper Perkiomen Valley and wrote many, many pieces of music. This is just an example, Kiss Me, Dear Mother, The Angels Have Come, that is in the Library of Congress collection. But many, many, many pieces of music. He was very prolific. He was a well-known conductor of bands and orchestras, um, in in locally and throughout southeastern Pennsylvania, um, just a very very well known musician through the late nineteenth century. However, in night on February sixteenth, nineteen o five, Harry Bechtel's body was found near Haddonfield, New Jersey, on a road leading to the Milford Road, which is now called Crescent Road in Haddonfield, New Jersey. And he was found kneeling in the snow by, by a local farmer found him and he was frozen solid with lacerations on his face and head. And his former music student, Charles W. Keeley identified his body and said there was a large amount of money missing from his vest. Um, and, and then several personal items, his watch, hat and overcoat were also found missing. So this was very mysterious and um, the police and the coroner initially thought it was uh, definitely an accident. It was a misadventure as they say in um, England and Australia that he was uh, he died by, from natural causes or exposure from being out in the winter. Um, but th th here are the questions that I have, and th this is there's really a lot of material in the newspapers of the time about Bechtel's murder. And he had told his mother and sister, he, he was living at the time here in Pennsburg or East Greenville, and he told his mother and sister that he was going to Philadelphia on some business and he would be back home that same evening. So uh, presumably he... He was taking he was taking the train um, to Philadelphia. So what then was he doing near Haddonfield? Nobody has ever explained why he was in Haddonfield, New Jersey, which is not that far from from Philadelphia. It's in Camden County, but still there was no no explanation at all for why he was in Haddonfield. And what was he doing on foot in Haddonfield in the snow? Um, Keeley said that that Bechtel was a drinker, really an alcoholic. And um, the my questions are: Is how did Keeley know that this man, that Bechtel, had a large amount of cash on him, and had he seen him before his death? Because that all didn't make sense. How Ke Ke Keeley knew all of these things. Um, uh, the coroner said that he died of apoplexy, which is uh, the old fashioned word for a, a stroke, basically. And um, the lacerations could have been falling face forward onto the ice. But the family never believed that as families are wont to do. They don't believe these uh, kinds of stories and certainly believe that he was murdered. Um, there were no footprints found around the body and but they did find uh, marks from a sleigh. So some people presumed that maybe he had been um, dropped there from a sleigh, which makes sense because how else would he have gotten there? There had to be some way he had gotten there. 
Um, but this is quite the mystery. And if somebody really was in the mood to do some research, I think it would be a great project to see how poor Harry died. Um, but Harry was extremely popular and well-known. And um, 3,000 people came to his funeral and there he is uh, buried in New Goshenhoppen. Now, these are some interesting folks. So Maud Hutchinson, who is uh, her, uh, genealogical record number 196 to 11, married a member of the British peerage, um, Gerald Villiers Stewart, who was, in addition to being a member of the British peerage, a, um, an author and playwright, and owned this amazing a state that still is there. So if you want to go to Waterford, Ireland, and you can stay at this place. And it's um, a medieval house. It's a very early house with some even earlier sections, I think, on this beautiful river in Ireland. It must be a stunning place. Um, her granddaughter was a woman named um, Granny Mary Villiers Stewart Duff Gordon. And she was a, a, um, a model for Chanel and Balmain and other fashion houses in Paris and married herself a baronet. She found a baronet to marry who was this Duff Gordon. And they had this son who is, you know, this is a guy who is with us today, uh, Sir Cosmo Henry Villiers Duff Gordon, who <laughs> was born in 1968. Um, he is a, a fairly well-known character in England because of his unfortunate um, past life where he was a heroin addict. Um, the, the, you know, these, some of these families suffered terribly through, because of their privilege. This is where privilege did not help them at all. Um, his mother had been an alcoholic, so that was of no help, but he got past his addictions. He's a recovering addict and he himself opened a, a rehab center in London and that caters specifically to people of his ilk. Our, our aristocrats and noble people and celebrities. So it's a very discreet rehab center in London. And he's, as I said, a, a quite well-known character. However, he had an infamous great uncle on his father's side. Once again, these are not the Schwenkfelder people, but a um, um, uh, his other side of his family. Does anybody know this name? If you're interested in a, oh, <laughs> Josh knows. Hand, right? Well, yes, good Josh. <laughs> he he was um Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon was um uh, an infamous character on who um sailed on the Titanic. And on that fateful night, he was he was actually called the coward of the Titanic because he got on the first um lifeboat with his wife and her her um secretary her whatever her maid and um it was he he had a lot of reasons why he did this but he really suffered from this for the rest of his life that he was the coward of the titanic for um not allowing a woman to take his place and he had as i said there were a lot of excuses a very famous story and he did appear in the movie. So <laughs> if you watch the movie, there is a character that plays Sir Cosmo in the movie. I feel bad that Cosmo, the young Cosmo ended up with this, this name, but I guess the family honors, honors his memory, even if um, he isn't well loved in, in the course of history. Um, I, I, this is just something I don't think you'll rare, you'll rarely see that um, Schwenkfelders <laughs> and Boxer in the same sentence. So I, I have two fellows to talk to you about, um, both of which had difficult lives. Um, first, we have Hans Hartraft. He was John Frederick Hans Hartraft. So who was he named after? 
Yeah. He was named after the general and the governor. They were cousins, apparently, of the governor. I I don't know. The governor was deceased by the time. Um, well, no, he wasn't. He was born in 1885. The governor was still with us. Um, so, uh, but anyway, so John Frederick um, Hans Hartrap was a well-known uh, fledgling boxer in Allentown. And this is one of his matches that you see here from the newspaper in the extraordinary fistic battle. I never even knew that was a word, fistic. And here are more. Um, he did not have a very long... Um, um, career in the ring at all, only from 1902 to 1903. Um, he, he was doing okay, I guess, in terms of um, his uh, fighting, but it did not last long. And specifically because of this, um, he had in 1902, a fight with this individual named Frank Smith, and um, knocked him out, and and Frank Smith then died, which is a, a horrible situation. And um, Hartraff then was had to go before a judge, and the, he was found not guilty of um, the. Wait, let me see if I can find it was placed on trial alone for involuntary manslaughter on the accusation of having killed Frank J. Smith in a boxing bout. It only took a short time to select the jury. Um, the prosecution took the entire morning to present its case. Um, it is expected the trial will take all day. The prosecution was unable to prove that a blow was struck that resulted in death. The court directed the jury to find a heart verdict of not guilty against heart trap but Hartraff got the cost. So he was found not guilty, but it, it actually um, put an end to his career as, as it might. And sadly, his, his end came very soon thereafter in July, 1903, where he was working in Bryn Mawr on, it, it says he had been sent to assist in the erection of a standpipe Hartraft, with a dozen other workmen, among whom were Claude Snyder, also of this city, were engaged in adjusting some of the iron fixings around the rim of the tower when the board upon which he was standing broke. By grabbing the scaffold, Hartraft managed to hold on for a moment, but he soon was obliged to relax his hole and fell to the ground a distance of 50 feet. The young man's skull was crushed and he died almost instantly. So very sad ending. And he had... Um, uh, later on, a few years later, his elderly father committed suicide by jumping off a bridge in, in Allentown. I don't know if all these things were connected, but they were pretty awful. And then his, um, it was either his aunt or sister's husband was murdered. So they had a very difficult time, these, these Allentown hard traps. Now, this fellow um, had a much better career, Dave Deschler who was a boxer, boxer in Massachusetts and a descendant of actually Wagner's that were in Easton and the Lehigh Valley, um, Schwenkfelder Wagner's in the um, 18th through the 19th century. So here, his, his record was, oh, you know, pretty close, uh, He but he did very well and was a well-known um, a uh, lightweight boxer around Boston in the early 20th century, quite well known and quite well thought of, so much so that they named a cocktail after him. Now tell me, is there another Schweinfelder descendant that has a cocktail named after them? <laughs> and it was it's somewhat like a Manhattan, if you're familiar with Manhattans. Uh, but that's that it's a uh, well known from the 1930s in honor of Dave Deschler, the boxer. Um, and so when his career was over, he turned instead to becoming a boxer and instru boxing instructor at Harvard. And who'd have thought that that even went on, that they had boxing instructors at Harvard. But I guess it was believed to be a gentlemanly sport of some level that they would have wanted to do at Harvard. However, <laughs> then this happened. 
And it, it, this is very curious because he was he was charged with having narcotic drugs in his possession and was held in $2,000 bond for hearing in the District Court of East Cambridge tomorrow morning. So, um, and it says he was arrested in a room um, hired from a Mrs. Lizzie Hamilton. The policemen were in the room awaiting the arrival of two men whom they had been looking for for two days. And when Deschler entered and saw the police officers, he leaped to another part of the room, grabbed a strong box and hurled it through the window. So, so uh, it, it's all a very strange tale of, of how this happened and why this happened with poor Dave Deschler. And then this, so he, he then had yet another career where he became a construction worker and was working on this building in Boston, 192 Commonwealth Avenue in Boston, and fell from the fifth story window of that tall townhouse and broke his back. Poor Dave, Dave, Dave couldn't catch a break. And then died and he then died in 1934. Okay. So this fellow um, really caught my eye. Uh, Reverend Price Z. Supley, um, who is a who uh, was a member of the family, the Supleys that married into the Schwenkfelder families. There were numerous of them, particularly with the Wagners who were in um, central Montgomery County in the middle district, the Schwenkfelder middle district. And he was a Quaker pastor um, who decided that he would make it his business to go and assist the people of the Welsh Mountain community. Are you familiar with the Welsh Mountain? Excuse me, with the Welsh Mountain? Have you driven through there? It's Route 10. I don't know if you can see on the map, um, but Route 10 that goes from Morgantown all the way down to Route 30. It's a really interesting drive. You have, yeah, I would I would do it sometime if, if you can. It's a beautiful area. It's um, preserved forest land in Lancaster County in part. It sort of straddles Chester and Lancaster counties, but just a, a quite beautiful area. Um, but during the time when Supli uh, wanted to go and help the people who lived on the mountain, it had a very interesting mix, uh, diverse mix of residents, which included uh, descendants of former slaves who were said to have been um, from the um, local furnaces and forges and that the Iron Masters had given them these plots of ground on the Welsh mountain, which were not very good plots of ground to farm. And so they were these, these black residents. And then some people say there were descendants of Native Americans lived there. And then some white people who were not always the most savory types. <laughs> um, and in particular, one, one family in particular that I'll get to in, in a few moments. But it is a fascinating history of this place. Most of the Black residents in particular were living in poverty, but overall everyone was living in poverty up there uh, because there wasn't anything for them. They couldn't really farm the land on the Welsh mountain and there wasn't any work for them either. It was a very isolated place um, in the 19th century. Um, so this is, a, this is a really interesting thing. Um, I, I subtly started a Sunday school at the hand board. So when I looked up what the hand boards were, they were a very well-known location on the Welsh mountain at this intersection of Route 8, 90, 97 and these other roads. And they were actually directional markers that looked like hands, which was something that they did, I guess, in the 18th and 19th century. And a gentleman um, recreated them to put them back. But this was sort of an infamous intersection where many bad things happened. So, but so interestingly, I um, so please started this Sunday school there. And I suppose that um, it was a well-known location too, not only being infamous, but well-known. Um, 
and centrally located, so it was a good place for him to start his Sunday school that was particularly dedicated to um, uh, the religious training of the young black children that lived on on the Welsh mountain. Um, so he he really had this notion early on to to try and help in the Welsh mountain, whether or not they wanted help, I don't know, but he he was trying to help, or I guess in his mind he was trying to help. Um, these are some examples. Actually, these are photos from our collection of a Welsh mountain log house, and that that house is particularly nice. So I I don't think that's um, a very good example of how people lived. I think I don't think everyone lived that way, and also of a schoolhouse that was later used um, by um, Mennonites who then brought a mission up to the Welsh Mountain as a, as a meeting house. And here, I just wanted to give you some side information about the Mennonite Welsh Mountain uh, Industrial Mission. Uh, a, the a Mennonites from Lancaster County saw the need to help these people and try to establish some sort of work for them on the mountain so they could pull themselves up, basically. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to get people in a state where they could be more self-sufficient and possibly go out in the world and, and have meaningful jobs. Uh, so they established this industrial mission where they were doing broom making and textile work and all those kinds of things that were relatively easy to get started with. They wove rugs um, in a in a place, a rural place on a mountain. Um, and it was said that this was formerly noted as a hiding place for worthless classes. So that's delightful, isn't it? <laughs> and here is here is what in our collection is called a gang hut. To me, it actually looks like an old charcoal burner's hut. Um, the Iron Masters had deforested the um, the mountain uh, during the times of when the furnaces were going full tilt. Um, and so charcoal burning was an essential aspect of, of providing charcoal for the furnace. And they often lived in huts like this. But in this case, it's considered... Um, somewhere where people hung out and hid out uh, on the mountain. And specifically, these are the guys who may have been hiding out on the mountain, or we know they were. Um, the Buzzard Brothers, Abe and Ike, and these guys were, um, uh, well, Price Supply um, made it another one of his missions to get these men to surrender to the police because they were notorious robbers and burglars. Uh, as far as I can tell, they really didn't commit any violent crimes. So there were more than enough violent crimes that went on um, on the Welsh mountain, including at those hand boards, as apparently in the 1890s, two murders at the hand boards and, um, and other murders later in the 20th century. But these fellows, as far as I could tell, were really robbers and burglars and, and were not killers. Um, so Price Upley did talk them into turning themselves in. So that was one of his great accomplishments. Um, they were part of a family of, of outlaws that lived up there and were able to hide up there from the police. They'd descend off the mountain and go rob people, rob the local farmers, and then go back and hide in their huts and, and in the woods and so forth. Oh, that, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's their hut again, or a hut. And then to end today, I'm a little shorter than usual today. Um, this fellow, um, Irvin Yeworth. Now, his family name was actually Yakel, but at some point, and it wasn't during the First World War, it was um, before that, when people, they changed their name to a more sort of Anglo sounding version of Yakel. Um, and there's, I, I can't find the reason why they chose to do this, but it wasn't when other people were doing that, which was during the First World War. Um, it was quite some time before that where they changed their name. Um, so he was a descendant of um, 
that uh, Yakel in the ge genealogical record. And does anybody know what he was responsible for? Something very famous. Okay. This. <laughs> he was the um, producer of the blob, which I think is really quite amazing. He um, actually then, after he did this, which is such a a um, significant part of American popular culture, he then went on to produce um, more religious type films and things like that. He was making that kind of film and no longer making um, this kind of craziness. But, <laughs> but quite remarkable, isn't it, that he ended up in our genealogical record. And thank you so much for attending today. I'm sorry, I'm a little shorter than usual, but I hope you enjoyed it. And do you have any questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs> no, no questions. I always I always go by the number of slides I have, thinking that it will take it out. Oh.